All right, uh, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to the last edition of Math 1203, our asynchronous lecture. Uh, have two more topics to cover. Um, so let's actually get into it. All right. Change the view here. Okay, awesome. Um, so as I mentioned in the lecture before this one, uh, on the fourth, that we'll be having one more thing to talk about. Um, well, two more things, one more lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about integration by substitution, as well as an application uh, of errors between curves. So these are the last uh, couple of things we want to cover for this semester, and they will be helpful on your final to get you some extra points. So let's actually jump into it. So uh, we looked at, and maybe I'll just do a, uh, do I wanna do a quick recap? Maybe let's do that. Um, so last time uh, we were looking at something called antiderivatives, which was like uh, we reversed the derivative. So we came up with rules to reverse the derivative. Um, so finding an antiderivative of a function pretty much means we wanted to find a function that when you differentiated that function, you got the function that you had here. And we looked at some rules for how to do that and some notations for how to do that. And we did a bunch of examples. Now it turns out that with this method, we are able to solve the area problem, which is to find the area under a curve by something called the definite integral. So we had the definition of what a definite integral is based on Riemann sums and taking an infinite limit of Riemann sums. However, um, it turns out a shortcut to doing that is finding the antiderivative of the function that you want to find the area under and then evaluating it at the endpoints of the interval. So you take the uh, top number, plug into the antiderivative and the bottom number, plug into the antiderivative. And this was one part of a very important theorem called the fundamental theorem of calculus. So now, um, what we're going to do is talk about another method by which we can actually compute antiderivatives for certain functions. So we had some rules here. Uh, let me find them here for how we can compute antiderivatives. And for this class, we want to do it in uh, these special cases. Uh, so we want to be able to find the antiderivative for something that looks like x to the n, antiderivative for something that looks like e to the kx, antiderivative for something that looks like 1 over x, and we know the rules for finding those. It turns out, however, sometimes we're not given a function that fits very nicely with the rules, and there are a multitude of techniques that we can use to actually find antiderivatives for such functions. Um, in this class, though, we only need one technique. Uh, so this is going to be the only sophisticated technique for finding antiderivatives, aka integrals that we'll be doing. It's called integration by substitution. And essentially what that is, it's actually the reverse of the chain rule. Um, so it turns out the same way that we can get formulas to reverse specific antiderivatives for specific functions. We also have rules that reverse entire methods of derivatives. So there is the reverse of the product rule. We can do that. It's called integration by parts. And the reverse of the chain rule is actually integration by substitution. Um, and so that's what we're going to learn about. Before we get into that, though, I do want to talk about just approaching integrals in general, um, because you will need to compute these on the final. You will need to actually uh, compute definite as well as indefinite integrals. So you should kind of know how you want to approach integrals. And for a class like this, uh, we're very lucky because it turns out that other than applying the rules directly, um, this is the only other technique in town, really, aside from, you know, doing algebra to kind of simplify things. So let's actually look at that. Steps to compute integrals, right? So you're faced with a random integral, integral of f of x dx. How do you actually go about computing it? Well, for us, uh, just like with limits where we had a bunch of steps where here's what you try first, here's what you try second, here's what you try third, we're going to have these with antiderivatives as well. So the first thing you need to try to do is try to apply a basic rule. So you're going to look at the thing that you have, and does it look like a basic rule? 
yeah, if, if yes, you can apply it. So, um, so for example, oh, kind of. Make these a little smaller. So you want to try to apply a basic rule, right? So an example of that, uh, let's say um, you have the integral of x to the fifth. Well, you could just realize that that's rule one. And so you can just add one to the power divide by the new power plus C, right? Or you can have something like uh, the integral of seven over X. And you just realize that that is just seven times integral of one over X. And so you can have that, right? That's just ln of the absolute value of X, right? So you can have things that look just like these rules. So here you have a uh, rule rule one applying to this guy, and you have rule two applying to that guy. So the first thing you have to try to do is apply a basic rule. This is kind of equivalent to back in the limits when we're like, oh, the first thing you try to do is plug in the number, right? Same sort of thing. Um, if you have a random integral that you want to compute, the first thing you're going to try to do is, can I just apply one of the basic rules that I have? Um, so now if that doesn't work, what you're going to try to do is you're going to simplify, try to simplify so that you can apply a basic rule. So there are times when things will look like they're not in a form to apply a basic rule, but you can actually simplify them. So for example, probably want some space here. Let me just do some examples of this right here. So uh, for example, let's say you have something like, oh, uh, the integral of one over X cubed. How do you actually uh, integrate that? Well, we don't have a rule that applies here directly as it looks. Um, we have a rule for one over X, which is not one over X cubed. Um, however, we don't have something for like one over X cubed. Um, however, what we can do is we can actually simplify this in, in terms of like rewriting it. Um, so this would be that guy. And now it looks like X to the N, right? Um, so now it's like integral of X to the N. And so we'd be able to add one to the power divide by the new power plus C. So this is minus one half x to the minus two plus c. And that would be the answer, right? Um, or we can have something like the antiderivative of say x plus one all over x. Again, doesn't look like a basic rule that we have. However, um, I could simplify this by dividing and then this would be one plus one over X. And here uh, we can apply rule one. Here we can apply rule two. So rule one, just this becomes X, rule two that becomes ln of absolute value of X. Right now, that's rule one. There are a couple ways you can see that that was rule one. Uh, one is to just actually just know that by heart. We know that when we differentiate x, we get one. So the antiderivative of one should be x. But you can also think about one as being um, the integral of one is the same as the integral of x to the zero. So you add one to the power divided by the new power plus c. So you get x plus c. Right. Either way, you can get here. Right? So the important thing is um, either something is going to look like a basic rule or you can simplify it to look like a basic rule. And these are the first two things you wanna try. Now it turns out sometimes neither of those two things work, right? Um, and that puts us in a very uh, 
precarious situation. However, uh, there are methods to deal with more complicated situations. So one such method, and the only other method we would need to know, is called integration by substitution. As the name suggests, we're going to substitute uh, something to make things nicer. And we do this in the case where the other two things don't work. So if we're in a class like a calculus two class where we learn a lot more, many more integration techniques, I would tell you a lot of other things that you would have to look out for uh, to know if you can actually um, solve the integral by this method. But for you guys, this is, it's the only other thing that's there, right? Either it's a basic rule or you simplify that it can look like a basic rule, meaning algebraically simplify, or uh, it's substitution. There's, there's nothing else. So um, once you know that one of the other two methods don't work, you'll, you're going to try substitution. So here is how that works. As I mentioned, substitution is just the reverse of the chain rule. Um, we know the chain rule, as you can see here, it says the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. The idea being, if I wanted to take the antiderivative of something that looks like f prime of g of x um, times g prime of x, then the antiderivative of that would be just the f of g of x um, plus a constant, right? Now, this is usually very cumbersome to write out. And so what we do is you would replace your g with a u or some other variable. Uh, U is very customary to use in the first uh, situation, in, in the, just as a generic variable. Um, so much so that a lot of students call this method U substitution, which it's not really, it's just substitution. You don't have to substitute a U, but it's, it's, it's a typical variable that we use. So the idea is if we take the antiderivative of F prime of G of X times G prime of X, that is going to be f of g of x plus c. Now, the idea to see that this is what we want is to make a substitution. So if you set u to be your g of x, then this means that your du dx is going to be g prime, which means that your du solving for the differential is going to be g prime of x dx, right? And so what you can have here is that now when you go plug in, into the original integral, namely this guy, Uh, it becomes, um, well, f prime of u because your g of x is u, and then your g prime of x dx is just du. Now that uh, looks a lot simpler. And in fact, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know what that should be. That is just going to be f of u plus c, right? Because I just, f is the function that I have to differentiate to get f prime. Therefore, it is the antiderivative. It is one of the antiderivatives. And so we have that, right? And what I just described to you here is basically the uh, scenario that you would go through for integration by substitution. You are going to want to see some sort of inside function that you can replace or substitute a variable for that is going to make the integral that was complicated so this here is in a complicated form. But now with the substitution, this is a simpler form. Right? And complicated and simpler have a very specific definition here in this case. Complicated just means it doesn't look like a basic rule. I really don't know what to do with it. Simpler means, oh, now it looks like a very basic rule. It's obvious to see what the antiderivative has to be. Um, and so we can do that, okay? So that's what I was describing in words here. So 
let's actually look at the method, um, which there are a lot of words, uh, which the first time I read through it is probably going to be a little bit confusing. But uh, we'll do some examples, and hopefully after that you'll you'll get it. And I'll I'll talk about some I guess best practices. So uh, to compute an integral using the substitution method, and remember you only do this if it doesn't look like a basic rule, and you can't simplify it algebraically to look like a basic rule. Otherwise, you would just use the basic rules, right? So assuming that those two steps don't work, um, you would jump into substitution. So once you decide, oh, I need substitution to do this integral, how do you actually do it? Well, you start by you replacing a complicating expression in your integrand uh, with a variable, for example, u. Right, so you're going to look at your integral. You're going to realize uh, this thing over here, this is an inside function that is making this thing look complicated. If that were a single variable, the integrand would be a lot easier to deal with. So let's actually replace it with a single variable. Right Now, when you're replacing it with a single variable, there are two important things that you want to look for. So one, your substitution, you replacing that function with a single variable should make the integrand simpler. So that's the first thing. Simpler means specifically look like a basic rule. It has to look more like a basic rule by you swapping out that function. Secondly, the derivative of the thing that you substitute should be present elsewhere in the integrand as a factor, right? A, a product, right? That's because you have to have that times g prime of x thing, right? Right there, right? So once you say u equals g, then your du is going to be g prime dx you need to be able to replace that g prime. Now, if you have a constant multiplying, uh, uh, a non-zero constant multiplying the g prime, it doesn't matter, you can always factor it out, but the variable part of the derivative should be elsewhere in the function. Right? Now, by the way, that is not something that, uh, the second criteria is not something that works in general for substitution. Um, but for the kinds of substitution, you'd be asking a Calc 1 class. These two things are what you should look for. Uh, the first thing is always going to be true, no matter what level you're at. Uh, but the second one, you can actually have substitution where it's not obvious that the derivative is somewhere else in the function. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but for us in Math 1203, those are the two things you want to look for. I want to look to replace a function that makes the, the integral I'm looking at simpler, right? So that's the first thing I wanted to get simpler. And the derivative of the substitution must be elsewhere. Um, and you don't have to worry about uh, a constant factor. OK, so I think I mentioned that here. Yeah, provided. provided you ignore any constant factors, okay? So if instead of g prime of x, you have three times g prime of x, it doesn't matter. You can always factor out the three, right? So don't worry about the constant multipliers. Worry about the variable part of the function, okay? So, yeah. Now, after doing that, after choosing your u, you're gonna compute du, same way I did up here. Like once I chose my uh, u equals g prime, I then immediately had to find the derivative. And that led me to this equation here where I found uh, du, right? Finding the du is gonna be important because that's going to allow me to replace the dx part and then get a new integral in a new variable, right? So this is when I'm making the substitutions. Okay. So that was step three. Step four, you're going to plug in all these substitutions. You're going to simplify. And then the new integral that you get in the new variable u should look like a basic rule. And you can just now apply that rule, right? So um, once you can do that, you will now have an integral in a new variable that's a lot easier to deal with than the integral was before. And it will actually look more like a basic rule. And you can just integrate it. Now, once you do that, of course, your answer is going to be in this new variable, and you want to change back to the old variable. This is called back substitution. So whatever your u was before, you're going to take that expression and plug it back into where the u's are now in your final answer. And then that would be, that would be the answer. Um, there are 
It's also possible to do a definite integral using substitution, in which case you have a couple options you can do. Um, and when I get to an example like that, I'll explain what those are, okay? Um, and at this point, don't worry about if you're confused yet, uh, hopefully it will be more clear as we move on. So here are some examples we're gonna do by substitution. Here's the first example. Uh, the integral of x times the square root of one plus x squared dx. Now, first thing you should notice is this looks complicated. Right? What does it mean to look complicated? Um, it means does not look like basic rule, right? And remember what the, the basic rules are. Um, and copied them over here. So let me move those over, right? So you'll notice here that this integral that we're given doesn't look like any of these basic rules. It doesn't look like x to a power. It doesn't look like one over x. It doesn't look like e to the x, right? It doesn't look like any of these guys. Um, so we realize, hey, this guy looks complicated because it doesn't look like a basic rule. Now, could I simplify it to look like a basic rule? The answer is no. You can't distribute a radical across some, at least not with a finite number of terms. So this is complicated in that it doesn't look like a basic rule. And two, I can't simplify it to look like a basic rule. So my first one or two approaches won't work. So what I can do instead is try substitution. That's the only other thing in this class, right? So it has to be substitution. So now you look at this and you're like, well, what makes this complicated? Well, it's actually the sum under the radical, isn't it? That's what makes it complicated. Why? Because if it wasn't a sum under the radical, it would be fine, right? I mean, think about it. If you had, if you had something like x times the radical of x dx, that would be no trouble, right? Because then you would just write this as x to the one half, and then that would be x to the three halves, and then that would be x to the five over two times two fifths, right? Would be no problem. If there was a single variable under the radical, it would be easy. And so having noticed that, what we're going to do is we're going to make a substitution and put a single variable under the radical. So what I would do here is, and this thing is just wiggling. What I would do here is set u equals one plus x squared, the thing under the radical. Then what we're going to do is find du, that was the next step. So you're gonna differentiate the right side and then attach a dx to it. Right? Now, why is there a dx there? I explained it up, up here, right? So when you add u equals g of x, then your du dx, the derivative of u with respect to x, will be equal to g prime, and then you multiply by the dx on both sides. So you get du is equal to g prime dx, right? So you have to solve for the du, right? Now, next is, there are a couple ways to actually proceed here, but I would recommend this way, especially uh, at short notice. Um, um, Optional, but recommended. So what you can do here is uh, solve for dx. So here, what we would get is we would get our dx is equal to du over 2x. Now you're gonna see why this is uh, nice in a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to substitute. Okay, 
So now I'm going to go back to this original integral and wherever I saw the expression for u, I'm going to put it in. Wherever I saw my dx, I'm going to put that in, right? So now here, um, so the antiderivative of x times the radical of one plus x squared dx becomes X I didn't do anything with. However, I have my U, which is here. Okay, so my U is this guy over here. That's the guy that I'm putting here. And then uh, I have my DX right there. So this is my u. And then I also see that my dx is this expression. So that's my dx right here. So I can replace that dx with a du divided by 2x. And that's your dx. So you go and you substitute the u, you substitute the dx, right? That's why it's called integration by substitution. Now, what's going to happen is you'll notice that there's still an x here, and that's actually a problem, right? When you have du, you want only the variable u in the integrand. However, because the derivative was somewhere else in the function, this is nice, it's going to cancel, right? So what you'll have here is you'll notice that you'll have. This x will cancel that x. What's this thing? Yeah. Right? And so, and you can also factor out the two from the bottom. So that's one half. And the integral becomes that. So now there's something very important and very nice about this integral. It's actually easy, it actually looks like a basic rule. Um, now, this guy here is simpler. Why? Well, see, that guy is just this. Looks like a basic rule. So it went from a situation where it didn't look like a basic rule to a situation where it did. And now we can just apply the basic rule. It looks like x to a power, right? So I'm gonna add one to the power, divide by the new power. Adding one to a half makes it three halves. Dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying by two thirds. So this is going to be one half times two thirds times u to the three halves plus c. Our twos would cancel. And so I have one third u to the three halves plus c. Now that's the answer in u, but the answer, the question was asked in terms of a different variable, in terms of x, right? So, um, this is the answer in terms of u. Uh, we need and answer in terms of x. So this is what you call a back substitute. You substitute back the expression. So u originally was 1 plus x squared. So I can replace that. And that's your answer. Now, I explain this very in a very long-winded way. Um, substitution will be easier the more you practice, and it's not going to be that long. Um, but uh, I just wanted to go through it very slowly the first time. 
so you guys can actually see what's actually happening here. Okay, so to recap, we had an integral, it looked complicated. What does it mean to look complicated? It means it doesn't look like a basic rule and I can't simplify it algebraically to look like a basic rule. What do we do in that case? Well, we set a variable to equal the complicating expression. This is complicated because of the sum under the radical and I can't simplify a sum under a radical. So I replace the thing under the radical with a variable. Now it turns out that because here there's an x dx and here there's an x dx, right? This here is a good substitution. Right? Because I found the derivative elsewhere in the integrand as a product. Right? Now, again, I could ignore the constant factor. There's a, there's a two here, but like I said, we can ignore that. Why? Because I'm always able to factor off that two. In fact, I did later on. I factored it, it off and it became a half. Right? And so now what we can do is we can go and we can plug these guys in. We can plug in the u's and we can replace the dx. And so that's what we did. It's sometimes easier uh, visually for students to solve for dx. It's ten, not technically necessary, but I think most students actually find this easier to just solve for the dx and just plug in the dx. And by doing that, we end up with this integral here. The reason why we needed the derivative as a part of the du is so that now the x, the extra x's will cancel, right? So I replace the u and I replace the dx. There was an x left over, but the uh, replacing the dx part gave me an extra x to cancel that guy, which always happens whenever the derivative is in the du. And we end up with a much simpler integral, which looks like a basic rule, which we now know how to find the antiderivative of which now we can put it in the original variable by back substitution. And that's, that's it. Right. And you can check that if you differentiate this, uh, you will actually get back the uh, original answer. Right. If I were to take the derivative of a third one plus x squared, the three halves plus C, the answer would be X times the radical of one plus X squared. And you can try that if you want, um, but it's, it's true, right? Just apply the chain rule, it's gonna work. The three over two is gonna come down, the threes are gonna cancel, you're gonna get a half. Then going to subtract uh, one from the power, so the power becomes a half, which is a radical. Then you're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is a two X, and the two from the X is gonna cancel the one half that was left over, and you'll actually get that guy. Yeah, all right, so hopefully that was clear. Let's do uh, another example. Now for the other examples, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker because hopefully what we've done so far was clear. All right, so here's another one. Uh, the antiderivative of e to the x divided by one plus e to the x. Now. Again, this is complicated, right? It doesn't look like a basic rule. Um, you'll also notice what makes it complicated is the denominator. So uh, what I can do, because the denominator wasn't there, I would have the integral of e to the x. It's, it's, it'll be fine, right? So what I can do here is uh, set u equals one plus e to the x, the denominator. This means that my du is going to be the derivative of that side, e to the x dx. This means I can solve for my dx. It's gonna be du over e to the x. Then I'm going to go in and plug everything in. So my u was in the denominator and my 
uh, dx is du over e to the x. And there was an e to the x in the numerator just hanging out. So I have that. Okay. So hopefully you see that. So my u is here, which is here, which I plugged in here. My dx is here, which is here, which I plugged in there. And my e to the x is just the guy right here. He just stays, right? We didn't do anything with him. However, because the du has e to the x in it, now there's an e to the x that gets to be canceled. So let me just rewrite this. Just now that the e to the x gets to cancel. And so now this just becomes the integral of one over u du. Now that's nice. That looks like a basic rule, right? So um, that's just ln of absolute value of u plus c, which I can back substitute. And we have that. Right, so to go over this again, we had the integral of e to the x over one plus e to the x, dx. Looks complicated, right? It's complicated because of the denominator. So I replace the denominator with u, u equals one plus e to the x. Your du is equal to e to the x. Now your e to the x, this guy here tells you it's a good substitution. since we have e to the x dx in original integral. Or a constant times that. Right, so that tells you it's a good substitution and so you can continue. How do you continue? You solve for the dx, then you plug in the u and the dx. Whatever x's are left over should at this point cancel and give you an antiderivative purely in the variable u, which should be simpler. You should look like a basic rule or be very close to a basic rule where you can just algebraically manipulate it to get to one. And so that leaves you with an answer in terms of u, which you can back substitute to get four. Um, to get it back into the into in terms of x, right? So there we go. Let's do another example. Again, here's one. Looks complicated, doesn't it? Why is it complicated? Well, the denominator, of course. Um, there's a whole radical of uh, four minus x. Now, why is that complicated? Well, it's complicated because of the four minus x. Because you see, if it was just a single variable, if it was just one over radical x, that's not a problem. I would just rewrite that as x to the minus a half and do the power rule. So it's because of the sum in the denominator that there's a problem, the four minus x. So what can I do? Well, I can just... Uh, Set u equals four minus x. My du is just going to be minus one dx. Now, do I have minus one dx in the original integrand? Yeah, right, because it's a constant. I always, the constant factors don't matter, right? I have a one and I can think of this as say, a minus one times a one dx. So this is in the original integral.
So good substitution. So again, I can actually solve for the dx. And this is just going to be minus one du. And then I'm going to plug those guys in. So I have one over radical u. And my dx is just minus one du. So this is just minus one, one over at u du. Like I said, I can write that as u to the minus one half. Add one to the power, divide by the new power, plus c, and back substitute. And uh, there we go. So you can have that, or you can you can realize that this is just like a radical, right? So it's uh, minus two times the square root. Either way, that's the that's the integral. That's the antiderivative. To uh, another. Another example. Integral of three x over five plus x squared. Looks very complicated. Doesn't look like a basic rule. Why is it complicated? The denominator makes it complicated. Let's replace the denominator. So say u equals five plus x squared. This means that my du is equal to two x dx. This means that my dx is equal to du over 2x, right? Now, the fact that there's an x dx here is nice, right? So x dx, here you have x dx, that's good, right? So your dx being this is going to replace that guy. And your u is going to replace this guy. So now, you can plug these guys in. 3x, I didn't do anything with the denominator is u, and my dx is now du over 2x. The x's would cancel. I can factor a 3 over 2 out. And I have a one over u left. That looks like a basic rule. And now I can uh, back substitute. So it was uh, five plus x squared. Let's do another one. Now this one's going to be a little bit more challenging because it's a definite integral. Right? So this one has numbers on it, right? So this guy here, I want you to notice it's a definite integral. How do I know it's a definite integral? Well, there are numbers on the integral sign. So 
So how do you go about doing this? Well, there are a couple ways that you can do this. One is you can do things the way that we've been doing it the whole time. Uh, but we know that the fundamental theorem of calculus says you have to eventually plug in the top number, then uh, plug in the bottom number, right? Uh, by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the idea is you can first get the answer in terms of x's, then plug in x equals e, then x equals one, and then find the answer. Um, but there's another option. You can actually change the limits to be in the new variable as well. And then once you get the answer in use, you don't have to change back the x's. You can just plug in the variable for use. Now, the second method for this class, I don't think there's a benefit to use it. Um, in a Cal 2 class, there would be benefit. Um, there are times when you would want to change the limits. Um, but here, we, uh, I don't think it's necessary. I'm going to show you the method anyway, but it's not really necessary. So uh, method one. Uh, find the answer as before in terms of x, then apply the FTC. Okay, so what would what would that actually look like? Let's actually do it. So here I have one to the e of uh, ln x over x. So that's complicated. Why is it complicated? Doesn't look like a basic rule. Okay, how can I get it to look like a basic rule? I have to substitute something. Set u equals something um, that is going to make it simpler. Now, what is making this complicated? Well. You might think that the LNX is making it complicated because uh, if it was like a constant over X, like a one over X or an X over X, it would be easy. Um, another way you can realize that the LNX is the right thing to do here is because remember, you need the derivative to be somewhere else in the function. So because we have that over X, that makes the LNX a very convenient thing to substitute. Um, so what do we do? So here, you'll notice that if I set u equals ln x, then your du is going to be 1 over x dx. And your 1 over x dx is right here. So yeah, good substitution. Uh, some people might think that the denominator was making it complicated, and so they might think of replacing doing some like u equals x. However, I should probably take this opportunity to mention FYI, u equals x is always a bad substitution. Um, it will literally just change the variables to all u's and do nothing else for you. It'll look, it'll look just as complicated as it did before, just with a new variable, right? You're just swapping all the x's with the u's. It's not going to really do anything, right? It does nothing. Okay. So uh, you wouldn't do a substitution of u equals x no matter what. Okay. All right. So now, um, we have that substitution. We know it's going to work. So what we can do is solve for our dx. And then we plug in. So our ln was u, x I didn't do anything with. And then the dx becomes x du. Now, um, we do have limits on this integral. We want to put it back 
However, since we're changing to the variable use, there are no X's anymore. I want to indicate this by saying that I want X, uh, that I want X equals one up to E. Identify the limits as being in terms of X. Okay. We have that. So I know that these numbers E and one, I cannot plug them into U's because they belong to X's, not the U's, right? So you can indicate that there, right? So now um, what I do, essentially what I have is X going from one up to E of U D U. Uh, that's simple, looks like a basic rule. It's U squared over two, X goes from one up to E. Now, because I'm doing the fact that this is X goes from one up to E, this means I cannot plug into U. What I do first is back substitute. So U was LN of X. Now I can plug these guys in. So this is going to be ln of e squared over two minus ln of one squared over two. Now, of course, log of one is zero. ln of e is one. So this just becomes one half. That's it. Notice that nothing much changed until the very end is when I applied uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I just, re I just kept reminding myself that, okay, the numbers that I have, the one and the E there in terms of X's, 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 I can't plug them into U's. So after I switched back to X's, uh, which happened at this point at the back substitution, then I could be like, okay, now I can plug in these numbers. And so that's what I got. Now, there is another way you can approach this, which I mentioned isn't like super necessary. So if you're okay with the other method, you can just ignore this altogether. Um, so what this means, uh, what this does is to change the limits to be in terms of U. So no back substitution necessary. Okay. Um, you can change the limits with the original substitution equation. Okay. Now let's see how that's going to work. Um, so Again, here we have the integral of uh, one up to E of ln of X over X dx. U equals ln X, or du equals one over X dx. So your uh, dx equals X du. Now, in addition to this, what you can do 
is you can change the limits. Right? So we want to go from x's to u. So now we see that when x equals e, what does that mean for u? And when x equals 1, what does that mean for u? So for u, as in the letter u, the variable u. Um, so we can use the original substitution equation to tell us, right? u is the ln of x. So if x is e, this means your u is going to be ln of e, which is 1. And if x is 1, then your u is going to be ln of 1, which is 0. And so what you can do now is you can go back to the original integral. And then you would have uh, ln gets replaced with u. So there's a u here. There's an x in the denominator. We didn't do anything with it. Replacing dx with x du. That should be x du. And now what are the new limits? Well, it's 0 and 1. So now this is just the integral from 0 to 1 of u du. And notice here, I don't have to write x equals blah in the limits because these new numbers are in terms of u. So add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, 0 to 1. You plug in 1 minus plug in 0. You again get the answer of a half. Right? So you can either do everything as normal, reminding yourself that x is the variable where the limits uh, apply to. So you, you just go as you usually would through the process of integration by substitution. And once you back substitute and you get the x's back, then you plug in the numbers. The other option is to change the limits to be in terms of u's so that once you actually get the, in, the answer in terms of u, you can just plug in those numbers right away. And I mean, at here, you'd realize that the, the back substitution was not necessary. Um, at this point, uh, I would say either method is fine. It's up to personal preference. Um, there is, uh, there are situations in which I would recommend that you change the limits like always, and you don't do method one, but those situations are all in calc two. It's not a calc one thing. Um, so yeah, that's integration by substitution. So method to get uh, very complicated integrals to look easier so that you can apply the basic rules. It's essentially what it is. Um, so you see an expression that looks complicated, you replace it with a single variable, you find the, the differentials, you swap it out in terms of the new variable, your new integral should be easier in the new variable. You can just apply the basic rule, get the answer and, and move on. Now, one last thing I wanted to
is air between curves. Now, there are a few applications here, and usually I talk about several of them, um, but uh, this semester I'm just sticking to the one that we really care about, which is air between curves. I have notes about some of the other applications, and I think I just left them handwritten in here, but it's just a matter of interest. Like, you don't have to know that. So I'll talk about just uh, air between curves. Um, so we know that uh, antiderivatives were meant to solve the area problem. So now, in order to be able to do that, one of the things we need to want to do is to find the area between curves. So if we can uh, have an object where we want to find the area, if we have some way to describe the top curve, the top uh, a curve to describe the top portion of the object, and a curve to describe the bottom portion of the object, the area in between those two curves would be the area of the object, right? So that's what we want to do. Um, and so, for example, uh, we might want to do something like find the area bounded between a function y equals x squared and y equals radical x. Now, what is the idea here? I'm not sure why that switched back. I think I changed the. I didn't search back. I was like all the way over somewhere else. Okay. So here's the idea. Given some function f of x that's positive, I know the area under the curve is. between A and B is this guy, right? By definition, okay? So now uh, we want to figure out something like, what if I had two curves? Here's an F. There's a G. Now between A and B, I want to find the area between these two curves. Right? How do I find that? Well, the idea is we can just find the area under each curve individually and then subtract one from the other. Now, why can we do that is to just notice Observe, if I have this guy, and I want the area in between, like here, notice that what this is equal to is if I took the area under F, which is everything, right? Or maybe I should do this in a different color. Yeah. Uh, let's do that green. Area under F, right? So that's going to be that guy, okay? And then what I can do is I can subtract this area.
I can subtract the area under the G, which is this guy. And I subtract them. my screen just now. Okay. So the area between curves is equal to this guy. Notice that what I did was I found the area under the higher curve and subtracted the area under the lower curve, right? And so, in fact, this here, I could write as because integrals distribute across sums, I can write this as a whole integral like that. And so essentially what this bit turns out to be is this is like the top function minus the bottom function. Yes. So that's basically, that's basically the error between curves. So, i.e., um, if our f of x is greater than or equal to g of x on a, b, then the area of between f of x and g of x on AB is given by take the bigger guy minus the smaller guy. Right. But uh, intuitively, conceptually, uh, this is the that's the main idea. Okay, so let's uh, do an example. Now, sometimes AB is given to you, and sometimes you have to, you can actually figure it out based on uh, the properties of the functions, how the functions behave. I should probably mention that. Um, which I think on the final, if I do give something like this, I'd have you figure out uh, what the boundaries are. So uh, here I would say, So let's look at this example. Now, usually um, for error between curves, uh, the actual functions you have to integrate, they're not gonna be complicated. Your chances are you're not gonna need like a substitution or anything like that. Um, it's just the idea, making sure you, you know that, oh, it makes sense to take the integral of the top curve minus the bottom curve, take the definite integral. Um, so that's going to be the idea. Um, so the actual, integrate, the actual integration is not gonna be hard. It's just knowing how to set it up. So here, if we look at say y equals uh, 
x squared versus y equals x squared and y equals radical x. The error between them that we care about is going to be these, this error right here. That's the error that we want. So clearly here, the interval is going to be between zero and this guy, whatever that is. Now, I think you already know that the answer is going to be one, but um, so this is actually zero and one. So we'd integrate from zero to one of the top curve minus the bottom curve. Now, if it's not obvious, which it's not always obvious, that it's between zero and one, or the numbers aren't going to be obvious, you can actually figure it out, right? So. First thing you would note, uh, y equals radical x is the top function. And y equals x squared is the bottom function. Okay. Now what you wanna do is find intersections. So what you can do to find intersections, you set them equal to each other, right? So you'd have x squared equals rad x. Um, tons of ways to solve this. Again, you might see that zero and one would be the answers that you want. Um, if not, you can square both sides. Bring all x is to one side. Factor out an x. And so you get x equals zero or x cubed equals one. So you get x equals one. So you know that those are the two guys, right? Those are the two intersections. And those are the guys that you go and you put it here. So um, zero, that guy equals one, that guy. And so you can find the intersections. Now we know what the rule is. It's the error of the top function minus the integral of the top function minus the bottom function. So this is going to be between zero and one of top minus bottom. So this is going to be integral between zero and one of the top, which we know is radical x, bottom, which we know is x squared. We can see that from the picture, we made that note over here. So that integral is going to give us the error between the curves. This point, um, the integral itself is in bad. This is just x to the one half minus x to the two. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. Add one to the power divided by the new power between zero and one. Plug in one, get two thirds. Plug in one, get one third minus you plug in zero. So you get a third. And that's, uh, that's the green area. And that's it. That's error between curves. That's basically, that's basically the idea. Integral of top minus bottom. Now, 
you could change the variable of integration to in terms of y, and then it's going to be an integral of right minus left, but you don't have to worry about that. Any question I ask is going to be a top minus bottom kind of thing. Um, and you'll be able to do it like that. So um, I could tell you that I want you to find the error between zero and one, or I could have said, I want the error between zero and a half. Or if I don't tell you, and I just say, oh, find the error bounded between the curves, what you can do is you can find the intersection points and then integrate between those intersection points. Make sure between every pair of intersection points, you're integrating the top curve minus the bottom curve. Um, there are problems where these curves might switch roles. And so you integrate on each interval, um, top minus bottom, top minus bottom. And I think that's it. So I think we're already a little bit over time um, from what I usually do for my R04 section versus the L01 section, which I think I'm still within time. But um, either way, we're going to stop there. That's that's everything. That's uh, that's the entire course, and for sure, what you will need for the final. So hopefully that was clear. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me um, with time. But with those last two things, you will you now know everything that you have to know for this class. And um, yeah, I'll get you some extra points on the final. So we will stop there and uh, I'll upload this. Uh, so good luck to everyone. Uh, see you in the finals and hope you have a strong end to the end of the semester. I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.